Proverbs chapter 22, I want to give you a thought. And I'm going to bounce around again tonight, so I want you to kind of stay with me if you will. Proverbs 22 and verse number 5. Thorns and snares are in the way of the froward. He that doth keep his soul shall be far from them. Again, let's read that together. Thorns and snares are in the way of the froward. He that doth keep his soul shall be far from them. Tonight I I want to give you something. And again, some of these Proverbs are going to be very, very tough uh, to swallow. Uh, This is a a hard book to preach in an expository way because these these uh, these proverbs that they're they're written out in a different way, more of a poetic type, but they're also principles to live by versus a a promise. So they they are they're written out a little different, and so sometimes in the proverbs you almost have to take it by subject rather than by verse, and you kind of go that way. So tonight I want to give you a thought on the proverbs on addictions, bondage, snares, and traps. And I want it very practical, but again, we're going to bounce around a little bit in this proverb uh, tonight, and I want you to look at some of these. See, uh, many Christians today are are ineffective or ineffective for Christ because they have engaged in um, activities, actions, attitudes, habits that have left them addicted or snared by sin. Both Peter and Paul spoke about being servants of sin, the problem of the sinful bondage. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 19. You don't have to turn there. But the Bible says, While they promised them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. You know what bondage would be. It would be when you're ensnared or when you're wrapped up or when, you're, uh, when you are shackled, if you will, uh, by sin in that sense or, or imprisoned. And Peter is saying the person who is overcome by his lust is represented as being a slave to his own lust. Uh, so he is in bondage to it. And many people today, you come into churches, I don't visibly see anybody here tonight that's shackled with my own eyes, but there's probably people walking in tonight that are shackled, they're enslaved, in a spiritual bondage, if you will. And many people today believe that freedom means doing anything we want, but no one is ever completely free in that sense. So if we refuse to follow God, we will refuse our own sinful desires and become enslaved to what our bodies want or the flesh. And we become its servant of sin, if you will. Uh, I, I, let me clarify that with a Bible verse. Romans chapter 6, verse 19. Paul says, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh, for as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. So Paul basically says to understand this, when we think of a servant in the sense of the word, we we think of a man who gives a certain agreed part of his time to his master and receives a certain agreed wage for what he's doing. And within that agreed time, he is the at the disposal of a command or master. And when that time is completed, he's free to do whatever he likes. And during the working hours, he belongs to his master. But in his free time, he belongs to himself. See, in Paul's day... Uh, this status was a little different. Uh, the status of a slave was was different than it is what we would think today. Literally, this slave had no time to belong to himself. Every single moment belonged to his master. He literally was purchased and owned by the master. It wasn't that he had a time clock that he punched in or that he had a free time that he would go. He belonged to the master. Whatever the master said, if it was 2 o'clock in the morning, he dropped what he was doing and he pleased that master. I believe that's what Paul was talking about. You're enslaved, but there's really no time away. You're enslaved around the clock. You are a servant to your flesh. You're yielded to your flesh. John chapter 8, verse 34, Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committed a sin is the servant of sin. So, one or two things. Either you are yielded to the Spirit or you're a servant to sin. You're, you're, you're living... Uh, see, secular society labels the addictions of our day as diseases. 
a man that is a alcoholic. He's uh, he's got a disease of alcoholism. Uh, a woman uh, that is a drug addict. She is a, 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 has a disease of drug addiction. And can I tell you, uh, it's all still sin. We've we've almost uh, sugar coated those things and made them sound like oh nobody's born with the disease of alcoholism. I I do realize that there's some babies that are born with problems because their mother and their father did drugs and alcohol. But but we all are created with that sinful nature. But you understand uh, that alcohol is something you chose to drink. You understand that? And the drug is something you chose to put in your body. And you have become a servant of that. Many of you know what I'm talking about. You might have been former alcoholics or former drug addicts before God saved you and cleaned you up. And you know what I'm talking about. It enslaves you. One, uh, one uh, shoot of, of, of heroin or snort of cocaine or, or whatever it is that you did, it, you thought, man, that's the coolest thing. That's the best high in the world. That's, that's great. And it, it sucked you in, though. That crowd sucked you in. They promise you the world, they give you nothing. That's what sin does. Sin does the same thing. So uh, our actions or being in bondage to sinful habits are the results of choices a person makes. And if you are enslaved to a sinful habit, you are in a predicament because of choices you have made. Can I say this tonight? We are so, Victimization is so overrated. Everybody today is a victim. And that's the most annoying thing in the world. I do this. I, I shot all them people because my dad beat me when I was a kid. No. Man, listen, you shot all those people because you're evil. You know, and, and, and people are just... There, but they want to point the finger and become a victim. Friend, let me tell you, there are true stories about people that have went through traumatic experiences and it does mess with their mind. But can I tell you, when you pull that trigger or when you do that evil thing, at the end of it, you made the choice to do it. Victimization. Everybody wants to be a victim today. Everybody is a victim. Uh, but you're enslaved to sinful habits and you're in a predicament because of the choices. By the way, you can choose the sin, you can't choose the consequence. Go ahead and choose the sin and say, well, I'm going to do it. But you can't choose the outcome. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought, brought under the power of any. So Paul was free to do anything, but would not be controlled or mastered by anything but the Lord. That ought to be our, that ought to be our prayer. That ought to be our desire. The great truth of the Christian faith is... Not that it makes a man free to sin, but that it makes a man free not to sin. That is true grace. Grace is not giving me the liberty to go out here and do whatever I want to. Grace is what constrains me and shows me, hey, I want to please the Father. I want to please God. And I believe in grace just like anyone, but I don't believe in that lasciviousness. I believe in grace that causes me to live holy. And when a man really experiences Christian power, he becomes not the slave of his body, but its master. Many times a person may say, I will do what I like. What he means is that he will indulge the habit or passion which he has already has him in its grip. They're just doing what they're already serving. It's a dangerous thing. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27. I'm getting somewhere. Just listen to me. But I will keep under my body and bring it into subjection lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. This flesh that we live in is wicked. And it will cause you to be put on the shelf as fast as you can click your fingers together. It is wicked. When we lose control over our life, when we're, our character becomes weakened, when we reject God's Word and the leading of the Holy Spirit, when we open our life up to addictions and destructive habits such as alcohol, tobacco, prescription, illegal drugs, pornography, gambling, etc., all these addictions, and we become addicted to something, it tends to numb us from its destructiveness. Sometimes you can get an alcoholic in the room. And again, I, I, don't, I don't work with the uh, RU family or the RU ministry, if you will. It's, it's a discipleship program, but it, it also helps those that have addicts or addictions, rather. And, and uh, dealing with an alcoholic, often it, sometimes they don't see the danger in it. They don't see the struggle in it yet. They have to hit rock bottom. Many times a person uh, 
they're, they're so enslaved to that sin, they don't see the danger behind that sin. And I want to just go ahead and go into our proverb very briefly tonight, but I want you to see this. And we've got a little head start tonight. I want you to notice the snare of sinful habits. First of all, notice the snare of sinful habits. I read to you earlier Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 5. Let's read that again. Thorns and snares are in the way of the froward. He that doth keep his soul shall be far from them. Thorns and snares or traps, that's what they are, in the way of those who are froward. That word froward is from the word ekish, which means crooked, perverse, or twisted. So we're supposed to be on a straight path, right? The froward man, though, he's on a path that is crooked, perverse, twisted. Uh, his life is a mess. Proverbs chapter 29. Let's turn over there. Proverbs chapter 29, just a few chapters over. I want to read to you another verse out of the Proverbs about our sinful habits. Proverbs 29 and verse number 6. It says, In the transgression of an evil man there is a snare or a trap, but the righteous doth sing and rejoice. You don't have to turn to this passage, but Proverbs chapter 5, verse 22 says, His own iniquity shall take the wicked himself and shall be holden with the cords of sin, of his sins. So, again, those verses are talking about those that are servants of sin, those that have some type of sinful habit that they are enslaved with cords, they're held with their own sins, if you will, and they are bound. A man can be a king, yet a slave to his own sin. Isn't that crazy? Uh, on the other hand, a slave can be free because he sought Christ's forgiveness and lives a godly life. Either you want or two. You, either you're a slave to sin and you're kind of your own king, if you will, but yet a slave to your own sin, or you're a slave that has been forgiven and you've sought Christ's forgiveness and you've asked Him to, to, to plead the blood on this and, and Lord, just forgive me for what I've done. And you live a godly life. All of us are broken people, right? No, nobody up here telling you that they're better than you are, but there's some of you that are bound by sin. There's other of you that have been released and set free. And the only way you have been is not through a program. You've been set free through Christ. You can be. You can defeat that sinful habit. And you tell me a crowd this size, there's not someone in here or somebody's in here that doesn't have a sinful habit. Listen, we all have bad habits at times. We all have things we need to... Some habits are way, way worse than others, but I, I'll say this, we all have things that does not please the Lord. Either it possesses you and you are bound tonight by that sinful habit, or you are free in Christ. And the word take in that verse, uh, notice back in, in chapter 5, verse 22, the word take is from the word lakad, which means to capture, to be trapped, or seized, or snared. And it's actually used to describe an animal when it's captured in a net or a trap. A sinful living entraps the sinner. We know that. It entangles and complicates life. And the truth is also confirmed. Look at that other word up there. Uh, it's high, I, I highlighted it. You can highlight it in your Bible if you want to or underline it. It's the word holden. Holden. Verse 22. Holden. That word comes from the Hebrew word to mock. To mock. T-A-W-M-A-K which means to grasp or to seize. So the description is really a, a description of an addiction. Uh, sin grips, it traps, it binds a person like a rope uh, wrapped around an individual. It can't let you go. This especially is true about sexual sin. And Solomon talks about it in the fifth chapter of Proverbs. Solomon also uses another thing here. Look at that word cords or cord. It comes from the word chibo. And it, it really is a strong word. It has a, a, a full meaning is, is really hidden here. But it's a, it, it only means the cord or rope. It also means pain, sorrow, or destruction. There's a big meaning behind that word cords. It's not just a cord that would be wrapped around your arms, but it would be a cord that causes pain, sorrow, or destruction. And may I say this tonight, that addiction, that sinful habit, will bring you to destruction. Amen. You're not just going to carry that to the grave. 
You're not just going to say, well, I've got this bad, uh, bad habit, but, but it, it's not going to get any worse, and it's not going to take me anywhere. I may not be what I can be, but I'm not going anywhere any, any worse. No, it leads to pain, sorrow, destruction. That's where it leads. By the way, it's in Proverbs chapter 5. So the rope of their sin is a constant reminder of what they did. That's why a lot of people today, they live in guilt. What they thought was going to be fun is no longer fun. Their good time ended a long time ago, and now they're left with nothing but misery, heartache, and regret. And that's why you see those chords. Done nothing but caused guilt, sorrow, pain, uh, misery, and the book of Proverbs was written to warn us of the cords of corruption, sinful habits uh, that can encapsulate uh, uh, the ruin and, and, and ruin your testimony and influence for Christ. And the, 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 I call it the lasso of lust, uh, laziness, and, and loose ethics described as King Solomon. And w- listen, we can... We can go into all of what King Solomon did, and we'll touch on that just a little bit. But, but King Solomon made some horrible mistakes, and 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 we'll touch on that just a, just a little bit. Sinful living hinders the freedom of a person to serve Christ. There's a lot of people that are not serving Christ today because of what they're doing. They know, listen, they know they're not doing right, so they're not involved and they're not serving in their church because they know that on Saturday night they're not doing right, and on Friday night they're not doing right. They'll come to church occasionally on Sunday, but they know that they're not living for Christ. And and although uh, maybe some of them have repented, uh, because he has severely damaged his Christian testimony, he'll never get uh, through some of those cords of destruction. Well, I'll tell you, uh, you young people sitting here today, I know all of our teenagers and a lot of our college-age young people are over there let me just say, the decisions that affect you at 18, 19, and 20, they will last a lifetime. They can mess you up bad. They can mess you up bad. You Guard your testimony tonight. Guard your testimony. You know, a good name is worth more than silver and gold, what, what Proverbs says. Man, you, it's far above anything that you can purchase. It's above any gold or silver that you can go out here and buy a good name or a good testimony. Friend, if your testimony is good right now among the brethren and among the world, then you've got something. The boy, it only takes a second to lose it, doesn't it? It only takes a second to lose it. I'll never forget uh, a man that did some work for us one time up in North Carolina. And uh, he, he uh, boy, he, he had such a foul mouth. Um, he was, a, of course, we had to hire the guy. He did some work for us. And, man, you'd hear him. He said awful things. I mean, it was bad. And so finally, uh, he left, and one of his assistant guys was there, and I kind of knew the guy. And I was talking to him, and I said, man, I said, hey, your boss is a pretty rough guy. He said, oh, yeah. And uh, he said, you know what the kicker is? And I said, well, he said, he's a deacon up here in the, the Baptist church. Well, what a shame. What a shame. Man, I, and I thought, you know, that, that pastor up there may be a good man. That might be a good church. But boy, that deacon, he's given that church a bad name. He's given Christ a black eye when he he's calling himself a Christian. I'm sure if you ask him, hey, sir, do you know for sure you're going to heaven? He'd probably, oh, yeah, I'm a deacon down at the church. You know, but it, his testimony has been ruined. Boy, if he did that around me, you know he's done around a lot. It's in his heart. He's bound. Them cords are taking him further than he probably ever... I know construction's a rough job. I, I know there's frustrating times. It's a rough crowd you work around. But my friend, you need to keep your mouth right. Out of abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A lot of times people have reason uh, filth coming out their mouth because filth coming out their heart. Amen. And uh, He'll cleanse and forgive you what you've done. I, I want to just move on to the second thing tonight. It's the snare not only of sinful habits, but it's the snare of seduction and sexual sins. It's probably a good thing that most of our younger people are... are uh, all of our young people, as far as I know, are over next door. So it's adults primarily... But you talking about something that is that is so um, rampant in our churches today is the sin of, of sexual lust and desires. Seduction is busting our homes all to pieces. And Solomon actually warns repeatedly the snare of sexual sin. 
A person can be, literally become an addict to sexual sin, including pornography, homosexuality, and adultery. This sin is like a vice. It, it does not break easily. You don't just look at pornography one day and, and, or a week and say, I'm just stopping it altogether. Many people cannot do that. The consequences of living immoral uh, can leave a person snared or trapped. And by the way, He'll forgive you of that sin, but the damage done to your mind will be there forever. A lot of people today cannot think a clean thought because of what they've looked at. I, I want to give you a couple Bible examples of it. And I know, again, um, uh, I, you men especially, I want you to listen. I'm going to use three different Bible examples. And, and, and there's men in here that struggle with your eyes. You struggle and look at things you should not. Consider Amnon. Amnon's sexual snare. He had good parents. All these men I use tonight have good parents. He was the firstborn son of King David. He had true religion of Jehovah. I believe Amnon was a good young man. He, he could have had any eligible woman in the kingdom, in Israel. But he sexually fantasized over his sister Tamar. I can't believe when I read the story, he was so sick with the obsession for her. Now, he had a friend. We know he did. His name was Jonadab. By the way, it's all it took. He didn't have a bad group of friends. He had one friend and just pushed him over the top. But at the end of the day, it was, it was Amnon's decision. By the way, he paid the price for it. His sexual addiction to fantasize led to violently raping her consequently hating her and justifiably being killed by her brother Absalom. And he was a bond slave to his fantasies. Can I say this tonight with all due respect? You men, you better be careful what you fantasize. Oh yeah. You're in bondage. There's men in here tonight that you're in bondage to your imagination and it's wicked. That's why you cannot get joy that's why you despise certain kind of preaching like tonight. Biblical preaching, you're having a hard time because of the fantasies that's going through your mind. By the way, you might as well be committing adultery in your heart. You're married, there's a woman sitting beside you, yet in your mind you're with somebody else. That's wicked. It's wicked. You're watching things on television that you should not be watching. You're opening the doors. And let me say, February 4th, 5th, and 6th, we can help you. We can help you close some of them doors of, of vile and wickedness that you're watching. By the way, have sense enough to turn off HBO. Well, I sit up on, I can't sleep, so I'll go in there and turn on Cinemax. Really? Well, I bet that's real good Christian. You know, you can't hardly watch anything after a certain amount. Of time. It's wicked. The, the, listen, the, the, the commercials today are wicked. Many of them are, are... Listen, I saw a commercial yesterday. I got as mad as a hornet. A, a, a shaving commercial. Gillette. I told my wife, I'm never shaving my beard. Never. And yet another reason to not shave. Brother Tom, can I get an amen? There's an attack on masculinity. Man, it's, 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 it's like they're, they're painting men to be a bunch of wicked... Uh, crazy men. Let me just say this. Christian men, if there's ever been a time for you to rise up and stand for what you believe, it's today. Be a man. Be a gentleman. You shouldn't be a pig. You shouldn't be some crazy, uh, dirty something. You ought to be a polite gentleman that respects a woman and respects children. Can I say this? You ought to be a man. You ought to be a man. That's a whole different subject. You ought to be a man. 1 Kings chapter 11, verse. I told my wife I was going to be very polite tonight, very, very kind. And, uh, and I am. It's just, it, it is Bible, and I'm very passionate about that. 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 3 and 4. And he had 700 wives. This is Solomon. Princesses, 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. That's what they'll do. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, and his heart was of David his father. How did that happen? Here's another man that had good parents. Solomon first married out of the will of God against God's command. You men that are single in here today, 
it would be better for you to be single the rest of your life than marry a woman out of the will of God. Yes, it would be. You want to live in a life of misery to turn your heart away from the things of the Lord? Marry a woman for the way she looks. Now that ought to be on your checklist. I mean, I ain't lying. She ought to be pretty. Amen. But it shouldn't be number one. You ought to find someone that truly does love the Lord. Truly does love the Lord. Find her and then win her to God and then marry her. And uh, that would be nice. That's what my dad did. Amen. It worked for him uh, 45 years later. He, it, listen, what else he did? This king went to polygamy, also against God's command. It was always God's command. Always God's command. One man for one woman. Amen. And the third thing he did, he, he, his love for female variety became his sexual obsession. I believe Solomon had a sexual problem until he had a thousand women which destroyed his life. Goodness gracious. A thousand women. I, I'm not, the Bible clearly, 700 wives and 300. He was the wisest man to ever live, yet the dumbest to ever live. And, and had all, man, poor guy. And uh, this seduction of evil women can ensnare any man. Men, listen to me. The seduction of an evil woman can ensnare any man. You're looking at a man, and that's what I am. I'm a man. And I don't want to put myself in situations where it could be in a seductive situation because I'm just as much a man as you are. And there's men today, it doesn't take long for you to Google on the Internet, independent Baptist preachers falling all over the place. It doesn't take long at all. They're dropping like flies. And most of it can be traced back to a seductive woman and a sexually immoral man. We all sometimes we place it on the seductive. It ain't the, the woman. All the, it, it's the man too. He had to choose it. Understand? Oh, them women. They better no hush. How about you just love your wife? Amen. Just love your wife. Be 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 content with her. Solomon says, and some of you, man, if you have a hard time with this, you need to check up. Seriously. If you have a hard time swallowing something like this, it's, it, again, we're using Bible examples. Lynn, men, control your eyes. You are to control your eyes and not be taken by the flirtatious women at your job. You, you say, well, man, ain't no women at my job. You, some of you work on the docks and in construction. Or, uh, a girl could probably pick you up and body slam you. But wherever it is... <laughs> You say, you ought to see the women on my job, buddy. they got arms that big around. Well, okay. But uh, hey, thank God for that. Thank God for that. Some of you work around some that do not. And they like to flirt. And there's something about a woman that is naturally drawn to a leader. They, they look at it, men, they look at it differently than you and I look at it. Something about a man that takes charge and and by the way, men, that ought to tell you something in your home. Some of you need to step up and take charge. A woman's naturally attracted to someone that's not afraid to take charge spiritually. And so uh, sometimes you, you, you may be in a, in, a, in a position of management and all these different people are, boy, they're, they're flirting, and you can't handle it because you're not right. Boy, I'm telling you, if you will keep your eyes right, and we're going to get there just in a second, Solomon warns to not let the sensual woman take with the eyelids. Uh, look at Proverbs 4.25. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 25. Proverbs 4.25. The Bible says, Let thine eyes look right on, and let thine eyelids look straight before thee. What's Solomon saying? He, he's really telling us to... Uh, to, to not let the sensual woman, if you read that chapter, to take you with her eyelids. Something about it. Wouldn't be in the Bible if it wasn't. They start batting their eyes. And you're melting. It's not good. Not if she's not your wife. Amen. Somebody told me this week... Uh, I was somewhere and they said, Pastor, we had a man, a member of our church. He was one of the most saintly men. One of the most saintly men that I've ever, ever encountered. 
And he said when the man passed away, it came out later that this man had a girlfriend. He had been married all these years, but he had a girlfriend for over 20 years. And they said we went in his house. I'm talking about a man that was revered, a deacon, a man. And they said this man had dirty book after dirty book in his home dating back to the 50s and the 60s. This man had a problem. He covered it up, got away with it until his death. And you know, what's sad is that Solomon warns against the sensual woman to take you with her eyelids. or something about that. The word take, it comes from the Hebrew word uh, lachach, which means to seize or to snatch or to take or to marry. So a seductive woman is trouble that leads to being caught in a trap. I think one of the classic examples in this verse is another young man that had good parents. His name is Samson. Samson had good parents. He was a Nazarite. He was a fearless man and a judge of Israel for 20 years. Yet Samson lusted after a Philistine woman, was commanded not to, but this woman, Delilah, she's probably a beautiful woman, and in spite of obvious intentions to destroy him. I've never understood the fact that Solomon, every time he woke up from the lap of Delilah, he was fighting people. He might have been strong, but he wasn't the smartest cookie ever. Amen? And he, he kept waking up. And, and Why didn't they catch on? I, I don't know why he didn't, but I, I, here's what I believe the reason he didn't catch on is he was enslaved to sexual obsession. Couldn't get enough. Did they not see that coming? Do you realize that when you're enslaved, you don't see it coming? Preacher, why in the world did they... I'll tell you why. Because they were enslaved. That's why Samson just didn't... He didn't, he didn't get it. Because he truly thought he was in love with Delilah. And there's no doubt he had feelings for Delilah. But I'll tell you one thing. She despised him. It wasn't true love. Solomon again, he he links. Uh, turn to this will be probably one of the last places I turn. Um, Proverbs chapter seven. We're about to end tonight. You've been good listeners. I know this is sometimes tough to swallow, but it's very true. Proverbs chapter seven, verse twenty-one. Listen to what Solomon says about this. And men, I want you. But I'd love to have godly men. We do have some godly men, and I, I love the men that we have in this church. It's wonderful. But we need to be men that are chaste men. Men are holy. Men are pure. Uh, and, and, and that woman sitting beside you deserves that. They do. They deserve that. Proverbs chapter 7, verse 21, With her much fair speech she caused him to yield. With the flattering of her lips she forced him. Verse 22, He goeth after her straightway as an ox goeth to the slaughter, or as a fool to the correction of the stocks, till a dart strike through the lip, his liver and as a bird hasteth to the snare and knoweth not that it is for his life. Now this again, you've got to remember that Solomon again links sexual sin to being snared or trapped by using the picture of a fool sentenced to the stocks and fetters or a, a deer caught in a noose as is, as is also translated the person entrenched in sexual sin is like an ox that goes to the slaughterhouse. He no more realizes the serious issue of the, his actions than an irrational, uh, irrational beast that uh, has any um, hesitation or understanding of his actions upon his future. He just walks into this slaughterhouse stupidly, dumb, knowing that it's the last time he'll walk in there and that's exactly what someone that is enslaved to sexual sin just tra just just trots right in. Everything's all right until gone. Marriage, testimony, leader, sometimes job, whatever, gone. You walked right into it. Notice what he uses as an ox. He thinks that he's going to feast in green pastures. I believe that's why Solomon used that. But he's being led to the slaughterhouse. As a fool, he thinks he's going to play and have a great time, but all the while he's chained in these stocks. A bird, he thinks he's going to eat some easy food, but he's caught in the, in the teeth of a trap. See, the snare of sexual sin is a dangerous thing. Uh, 
I'm going to read to you a couple of verses here. Proverbs 22, verse 14. The mouth of a strange woman is a deep pit. He that is abhorred of the Lord shall fall therein. Man, the mouth of a strange woman is a deep pit. Kisses and seductive, deceptive words of an immoral woman are described here as a deep pit or a trap. That word abhorred is the Hebrew word zom, which means to denounce, show anger, or indignation. So the person who is the kind of attitude toward God is especially susceptible to sexual snares. You say, why is that? Uh, when an individual is angry at God or angry toward the Lord, they disregard uh, the Word of God, they disregard uh, obedience, and, and, and restraints are not found in His Word. They, there's no guidelines, there's no boundaries. And let me just say this tonight. We all need boundaries. We all need guardrails, if you will. Can you imagine driving on this road out here without a yellow line? Can you imagine going around through here without guardrails and without men? Why is it that you'll just pick up a woman or have lunch with a woman that's not your wife and you say, we're out in public, it's not a big deal. It's a huge deal. You're just setting yourself up for someone to gossip about you. Ride around with someone. You say, oh, we're just co-workers. We're good. No, nah, I don't want to put myself in that situation. Not, not that I'm better than you, but I know what I am. I mean, would you like it if your pastor just picked up your wife and took her to lunch? Oh, how was your day, honey? Oh, it was good. Just ate lunch with the pastor. you choke right there. And then you choke me, hopefully. You wouldn't like that. Nor would I like you coming by my house picking my wife taking her to lunch. You have your own wife. And if you don't, get one. Amen. You're not doing that. I, you say, are you jealous? You better believe I'm jealous. I love my wife. We have a jealous God too. Nothing wrong with being jealous. I, I wish more men were jealous about that. Not je In the right way. Not just somebody looks at your wife and you want to knock them out. You know, wanting to speak to her about something logically and you're like, oh, he's talking to you. No, I'm not talking to you. That's crazy. I'm talking about you, you, you being very, uh, what's the word, discerning? You know? discernment. How does a man escape the traps of sensual uh, things, a woman, or uh, sensual things? Whether it, it is a seductive teenage girl, and men, you need to be careful about that. You need to be careful about that. A single woman. It doesn't have to be another man's wife all the time. It can be someone that... I, listen, there's been ministry after ministry after ministry destroyed because a man got too close to a single woman. By the way, all she has to do is say something. It may not even be true, but you're done. Oh, it ain't true. Well, her word against yours, pal, in these days, good luck. Good luck. You'll make the Gillette commercial. And, and listen, if they come to me, I'm not sweeping it under the rug. I'm dealing with it. It's not going to be a church that hides sin. We'll have to get it out in the open. We'll have to deal with it. I deal with it. Same. I hope you do the same with me. Investigate it. Hey, hey, we're going to invest. We're not just going to believe something. We'll, we'll, we'll investigate it. But friend, can I tell you, we cannot, we cannot put ourselves in those situations. We got to be what wisest, wisest servants, harmless as doves. Have to be using some brains. And when you counsel someone, it, it, for instance, an office is being put back together here very soon, and uh, I, I don't want to just go in there with a woman by myself and shut the door and there's no no way anybody can either see in or uh, then you're just setting yourself up for bad bad mistakes we don't want to do that you say well I'm, I'm pretty spiritual you may be but it just takes one bad mistake Proverbs 1.10 says my son if sinners entice thee consent thou not amen Proverbs chapter 4 verse 14 and 15 enter not into the path of wicked and go not in the way of evil men avoid it Pass not by it. Turn from it. Pass away. How can it be more clear? If you know it's not a good situation, go all the way around. Don't go through it. Man. Boy, we're going on this again next week. We can't... You know, some of you... You know, I want to get this in there. And we're not going to stay... There's a lot more snares, so I'm not, I'm not going to 
you know, go through it again like, like I did tonight. But I cannot. I can't. And by the way, ladies, yours is coming. So, you know, you don't get totally out, though it is a different, it's kind of a different dynamic with you because the next one, listen to this one, the snare of your speech. That's next Wednesday. Someone's like, oh, I got by on that. I'm not. Good. Well, we'll get you with the speech. Old Proverbs, man, we can't, you can't get out of it. And so all of us, it doesn't matter, uh, it doesn't matter who you are. You could have been married 40 years, 50 years, happily married. We still have to keep our guard up, be sober, be vigilant, watch out. There's been a many of a good woman and a many of a good man mistake, make mistakes. Just in a weak time, just in a moment of... And listen, before we close tonight, it's only 8.04, but before we close tonight, it would help you. Can I give you a little bit of advice? And again, I'm not an expert at marriage. Just next month, we'll be married 14 years. It's not a long time by any stretch. Um, we're still learning a lot in our marriage. Raising children, teenagers, and all that stuff. I mean, that's a whole different ball game. But, one thing that I think would help our marriages in this church was if some of you husbands and wives treat each other right. Here's the deal. You bicker and you fight all week and then that husband goes to the job and a woman flirts with him and says, oh, you're, you're handsome. You look good. I like the way you work. And the last thing he's heard you say is how sorry he is. You know what? When he comes to me and says, Preacher, I fouled up and this is what's been going on. And boy, I mean, Preacher, I'll tell you, I messed up. But I, I'll be honest, there's a woman down at work. She told me how good I did and how all this done. She said, All I do at home, we fight and bicker and mouth and just fight all over the time. I, I, although he did wrong, I can understand. I ain't gonna sit there and say, "Well, pal, I, you, you know, buddy, you know, it's gonna be all right. You didn't. It wasn't that bad. You deserved it." No, I'm not condoning sin, but you were part of it. What some of you are good about doing is pointing out every flaw in your mate's life, and never, not one time, ever bragging about the good that he does or she. So, all they ever hear you do is run your mouth about what he's not or she's not doing. And let me say, husbands, you treat her. She is a gift to you. You don't point out and you get home and you're just constantly fussing and cussing about what she ain't done. And There'll be a, there'll be a bowling point to where you get to that and they'll have enough. And some old yay bird down the... He's going to tell her how pretty she is and she's going to run off one day because she's sick of your sorry mouth about how you never say nothing good about her. And some old boy down the road says everything. Oh, she's the best thing. And by the way, he's just the devil's just got him. You know, the, the, the grass is not green on the other side. It's just a septic tank. Ain't, you know what I'm talking about. You'll you'll find he's he's just a sorry, or worse. He's probably worse. You know what I mean? You think? Oh, I, mean, I have to tell you what. It's it's awful green over there. It's just you know what's underneath that. About you about to find out. You understand? That was a good analogy, wasn't it? <laughs> Y'all understand though, we need to we need to compliment one another. Let's close our